Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This episode, we'll be talking, well, MLS Decision Day, which is upon us, the Shield, Manchester Blue, Hostages, the beautiful beast that is Holland, uh, Rest in Peace, Seattle, Kellen Acosta's Big Mouth, uh, Jesse Marsh's Big Mouth, the end of a broadcasting era, and so much more. But first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how you doing on this, uh, what are we looking at, Monday, October 3rd in the year 2022, if you can believe it. Doing well. That was quite the intro. We do have a lot to get to We today. do. We got all sorts of stuff to get to. Um, you, you, you watching anything interesting? Uh, well, first up, I'm caught up on House of the Dragon. Our producer, Sean Sullivan, with some stinging remarks wow. this morning. He is, wow. he is not enjoying this show. He's, he's done. He, is, he's, he thinks it's jump, jump the shark, if you will, and he is over it, gone. He, is, he would much rather watch the new uh, Lord of the Rings thing that's happening. So he's not having any of it. Mm. But more importantly, on your recommendation, I watched this excellent four-part HBO documentary on the Iran hostage crisis back in 1979. Obviously very prescient uh, given what's going on in Iran today. Yep. Uh, you told me you have lots of thoughts on this. I'll I, let you go. Well, so it's called Hostages, uh, and it is on HBO, as you mentioned. Four-part documentary. And I, I just thought it was fascinating. I, I, I'm fascinated by the whole thing um, and that there is a documentary that doesn't just rehash everything. Uh, it has new footage and, to a certain extent, new information, but also I think it provides context in how they got there. Obviously going back into the 50s and the, the coup that installed that, uh, that got rid of the president at that point, installed the Shah, and then the overthrow of the Shah and the Ayatollah coming in and all that. And as you mentioned, given the, uh, the events of, uh, of um, the current events that we have happening right now, it's amazing to see. Uh, for, for those that, that don't know, a, a group of students took over the American embassy, took uh, a bunch of hostages, and for 444 days held them hostage. Uh, in doing so, this is, you know, the, um, the law of uh, whatever, good intentions, uh, in that they wanted the Shah out, but they wanted to change and fundamentally change the country and the culture and the way that it was going. What it was interesting to me and sometimes we forget in this back and forth between Iran is what Iran once was. And it was an incredibly progressive and evolved and exciting and contemporary uh, in terms of its, uh, its, its culture and the way that it dealt with women and education and technology. And all of that went away uh, after the Shah, who, believe me, it has, uh, deserves plenty of criticism. But it was fascinating to see this incredible culture change and then the students you know you got to be careful what you what you wish for and the ayatollah came came in and just to see them realize that uh oh we've kind of opened the door and the ayatollah was very smart in the way that he used that to uh to his advantage and unfortunately now multiple decades later it has not gone back but the the naivete of those students was interesting, but at times it was incredibly frustrating and angering for me to hear them talk about these ideals that they had and the illusions that they had. And not only did they, did they not get those, but they actually did the opposite maybe of what they were trying to do and they regressed this country in a way that it's never recovered. No, I agree with you. It's it's surreal to see images of a revolution in 1979 that ushered in the Islamic Republic, and now 43 years later, we're seeing similar scenes trying to overthrow uh, that uh, regime. So it's a it's, it's a great anyway. It's a great documentary. You should you should check it out. And uh, it was it was a time you know having kind of lived through it. It was always there, and it established for my generation and multiple generations the way that we view Iran. And, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about Iran coming forward in the World Cup, obviously being in the group and the history that we have in 1998 playing them in the group and uh, how we all understand that it all spills off of the field. So it was a wonderful peek back and a peek into what that country was, what it became, and unfortunately what uh, in many instances where what it uh, what it still is. So couldn't recommend it highly enough. So that was uh, that, that was a good one. Uh, anything else before we uh, light this candle? That's it. All right, let's light this candle. Where do you want to start? I mean, look, we are decision day is upon us this week. We are coming down to the final week of Major League Soccer. So we should probably start uh, with the conferences to get an idea of where everybody sits. Right. So let's start with uh, Eastern Conference. Does that sound OK? Sure. 
Uh, what games do you want to start with or you just want to look at it? I mean, you can see that, see it up there. It is close. There are a lot of different permutations when it goes, uh, when it comes to where player, where teams are going to finish both teams that are already making the playoffs, but also if they are even going to get into the playoffs. This is what we want. So the top four have clinched playoff berths. That's Philadelphia, Montreal, NYCFC, and the Red Bulls. And everybody from New England down is eliminated. So it's five through nine fighting for uh, three spots, five through eight separated by just one point, and then even expansion Charlotte is still alive. Um, and let's look at the West now. All right, we'll take a look at the West. It should be said that in the East, there are teams still, as we record this, that have two games left as opposed to the West where Correct. everybody is on 33 games and everybody has one game Correct. left. Uh, in the West, two teams clinched playoff berths this past weekend, uh, the Galaxy and Nashville. We'll talk about that in a minute. But so the top five have clinched playoff berths, LAFC, Austin, Dallas, Galaxy, and Nashville. And so uh, there are two playoff spots still up for grabs. Uh, it's teams five, oh, six, six. through six through nine uh, battling for those, and they meet uh, head to head on decision day, which makes it delicious. It's it's Minnesota amazing. hosting Vancouver, RSL hosting Portland, uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, so there's there's a lot that can happen midweek with the games because, uh, as we mentioned, you know Charlotte plays Columbus and then at Red Bull, Columbus plays Charlotte and then. Uh, at Orlando, by the way, at Charlotte. So Columbus has two away games, very, very difficult uh, for them. Miami coming down to it, uh, playing Orlando and uh, Montreal. Orlando obviously playing Miami and Columbus, and then Cincinnati at D.C. So stuff, stuff can change midweek, uh, and uh, we, we will uh, we will see how that affects everything. But this is exciting. But there were plenty of games this, uh, this past weekend that affected this. Where do you want to start? Well, this uh, penultimate uh, weekend of the regular season decided the Supporter Shield race. Uh, Philadelphia suffered a 4-0 defeat away to Charlotte, and that opened the door for LAFC. They clinched the Shield by virtue of a dramatic 2-1 win away to Portland. Carlos Vela with a wonderful finish to make it 1-0. Aspria equalized 1-1, and then Dennis Buanga with a stoppage time goal, his first for LAFC. For the second time in four seasons, LAFC win the Supporter Shield. Your thoughts? Congratulations, first off, to LAFC. It, it is an accomplishment. Is it the ultimate accomplishment in Major League Soccer? We know that it's not, um, and I think that there is some perspective on it, but it is absolutely worth celebrating. LAFC folks should celebrate this. Congratulations to the team. Congratulations to first-year head coach when it comes to Major League Soccer and Steve Terundolo. Congratulations to uh, Joe Thorrington uh, out there. And keep in mind, remember we had Steve Terundolo on the State of the Union at the very beginning of the year, and he was coming off a, let's, let's be honest, a horrible year in Las Vegas. And again, Mossy, I say it with players. It, it, it applies sometimes with uh, coaches too. Form is fallacy. This is a guy that was, let's be honest, horrible uh, with, Van uh, with Las Vegas and then came, albeit he was given the keys to a very nice, fast, shiny car, an expensive car, but he still had to guide this team through and ultimately has won su uh, supporter shield. And he deserves a tremendous amount of credit. I think he will be in the running for coach of the year. I'm not sure he, he will win it, but uh, certainly a shout. Can I read you a quote yes. from Matt Doyle's armchair analyst? Sure, Colin. of course. We love Matt. The Shield is the best trophy you can win in MLS and the truest representation we have of who the best team in the league actually is. Give me 34 games spread across eight months over a five-game autumn hot streak any day. LAFC are the champs. Now, this reflects a point I've made on this podcast for years. Uh, there's a desire to have your cake and eat it too, to appease soccer fans who are conditioned from following other leagues around the world to think that the team with the most points over the long haul is the champion, but also to have the excitement and drama of playoffs culminating in a final, which is intrinsic in American sports culture. Uh, and so I've always said that it's created a somewhat odd dynamic. I don't think there's any other sports league in the world that crowns a champion at the end of the season, and yet you have people arguing that another trophy that another team won along the way is actually more significant. Whenever I've made that point, you've always said no serious person actually thinks that. It's just bitter fans of teams that won the Shield and didn't win MLS Cup. Well, you can't get more serious than Matt Doyle. <laughs> Oh, I'm not putting it past him to be bitter about things. Uh, we all are bitter about different things. I, I, I completely disagree. No, I don't disagree that it is not that it that can't be used to justify an opinion that this is the best team in Major League Soccer. Okay, that's that's fine if you're because you're looking at it over the long haul, and I I understand that. But 
the most important thing is still Major League Soccer's MLS Cup, okay? And nobody remembers who won the Supporters' Shield. The, the confetti and the song and the attention and the focus and the history is reserved for Major League Soccer's MLS Cup. I'm sorry, that's just the way that it is. I'm sorry to, you know, to burst your bubble there, Matt. You can say it as much as you want. And I actually appreciate and respect that you are saying it, especially given uh, who you work for. But you're, you're wrong. <laughs> you're, you're wrong in that, it's, in that it's more important or that, well, not, I mean, I, I, it's an opinion, but you think that it should be more important. It's not that we completely dismiss it. What I've always said is that when it comes to assessing teams in totality, those that are able to parlay their success in the regular season into success in the postseason, those, in my estimation, are even better. So there is not a chance that I would ever look at an MLS team that was only good in the regular season as one of my best teams ever. I just, no, I just, I, I can't do it. I think that you have, you come in knowing, everybody understands what the, what the rules, regulations, the structure is, and that there are two parts. Is it, to a certain extent, a crapshoot when it comes to the playoffs? Yes, but those teams that have been able to parlay it, the coaches and those, uh, and those players, they deserve a tremendous amount of credit and even more credit than any other team. And we might need to get Matt Doyle on this podcast. Yeah, we will. We, I'd love um, to have him on. Uh, I, lo I love, I love his, uh, his, uh, his incredible brain. No. Uh, we should say, Philadelphia now in danger of squandering the one seed in the East. They're right. only two points up on Montreal, who beat D.C. this weekend. And Montreal have more wins. So, a final weekend, uh, they face Inter-Miami. Philadelphia faces Toronto. If Montreal were to win and Philadelphia were to drop points, Montreal would get the one seed in the East. Wow. What a me. Quite the development. Uh, let's hop back to the West. Uh, we mentioned that the LA Galaxy have clinched a playoff berth just the second time in the last six seasons that they will head to the postseason. They clinched by virtue of a 1-1 draw against RSL. Uh, Puj missed the penalty early. RSL took the lead. But then who else but Douglas Costa, money from the spot. <laughs> uh, it finished 1-1. Your former team, the Galaxy, headed to the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess welcome back. I never thought we'd get to a day when just making the playoffs would would be cause for celebration. And it's not, to be fair. I, I think that there it has been tempered in the way that Greg Vanny and company have looked at this, but that you haven't been there and that you're back, I think it it gives a reprieve to Greg Greg Vanny and maybe some of these players. Although I think that the offseason they are going to look to make some make some changes. However, it's it's not like they backed in. It's just they, they come in kind of still with a whimper in in uh, relative to other teams. And who knows? Maybe it works to their advantage, where people are counting them out. And there is there is we were talking about the difference between the regular season and and the uh, and the postseason. If you are able to get into the playoffs, there is an element where it is a new lease on life, and you can get rid of some baggage that existed in the uh, in the regular season and maybe LA says all right we can finally breathe we've done this part and now we can play in a much more refreshed and you know for lack of a better word expansive way than we have and by the way they're up to fourth in the west so yeah. they're actually in position to have a home game yep. here um I, we mentioned portland lost at home to lafc that's the result that got nashville in despite the fact that nashville lost its game to houston uh let's hop to the east here where nycfc clinched the berth before stepping on the field but then they promptly beat orlando 2-1 talis magna with a late winner uh People seeing some positive signs with NYCFC here that they might have re recovered their mojo a little bit. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it was always going to be difficult, obviously, losing your coach and losing your star goal scorer midseason. I, I think that they have improved. I, I don't I don't think that they are as good, and I think that's pretty obvious, than they were that they were a year ago. But if you're going to get better and you're going to get hotter, um, they're not blazing hot, but they're hotter. This is the, this is the time to do it, and you know they looked very very good ultimately uh, in that game. And you know they're sitting pretty. They're going to host a game. I don't know where they're going to host it, <laughs> given the many, pl many places that they play. But at some point there will be a quote unquote home game featuring NYCFC, and I guess in the greater New York metropolitan area or not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Orlando failing to seal the deal. They're looking to make it three straight. Uh, 
playoff appearances under Oscar Pereja, but now they have to sweat it out. As you mentioned, midweek game against Inter Miami and then decision day, that's our FS1 game. They will face Columbus. Um, Friday night, Inter Miami, 1-0 winners away to Toronto. Gonzalo Higuain, 12 goals in the last 14 games. I'm old enough to remember when the whole narrative was Inter Miami were succeeding because Phil Neville had the courage to bench right. Gonzalo Higuain, and now he's carrying them it's, down the street. It's an incredible turn of events. And whatever that button was that Neville pressed, it has worked out incredibly. And he deserves a tremendous amount of credit if they can get him through here to the playoffs. And even not, it's just pretty, it's pretty amazing what that team has done, you know, given the cheating and the problems that they, that they have had. And I mean, that was a huge, huge win against a much improved Toronto and obviously, uh, obviously away. And now they have a chance to finish it off here uh, this week, but it's going to come down to the wire. And this is what you want. You want multiple teams vying for those, uh, for those playoff spots and that music stopping. Now, midweek will change some stuff, but you know, this weekend in Decision Day, I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, two games in the state of Ohio that really blew the playoff race wide open. Columbus were trailing the Red Bulls 1-0 late, but Derek Etienne with two goals, they take it 2-1, so the crew very much alive still. They're alive, but I think that there is a worry. The good news for the, Col the Columbus crew is that they didn't blow the lead at the end, uh, so they, they did what they needed to do, and I think a lot of Columbus crew fans were saying, uh-oh, I get that sinking feeling and it's going to happen. It didn't. They get, the, uh, they get those points. The problem is that they have to play both of their last two games uh, away. That sh Charlotte midweek game, we should say, that's uh, resuming a game that was stopped early on because of weather a few weeks ago. John Strong talked about this this past week, and there's all sorts of rules. There has to be the same players on the field, but the Charlotte has a center back that's – since torn his ACL and gotten injured. So that's going to be kind of a, a, a wonky scene here, resuming a game that had started a few weeks ago. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then Cincinnati looked to be in great shape, but they somehow found a way to lose at home to already eliminated Chicago 3-2. to two. So all of a sudden, this is going to be nervy. They're the one team in this mix that's at 33 games. So they're going to be watching on Wednesday, waiting to see what happens and seeing where they're at heading into decision day. Right. And so everyone as we said, uh, can, can figure out a way to, to get in or uh, can figure out a way to get, uh, get out. I think if, uh, I, if, so you look at it as getting in and getting out, right? I think if Columbus doesn't make the playoffs, that's, that it will be viewed as an incredible failure. I think if Miami doesn't make the playoffs, it's not as much of a failure given where they are coming from. I think that if Charlotte makes the playoffs, I mean, that would be an incredible success. So anything he right now is gravy. And I think if either Orlando or Cincinnati drop out, that would be a an incredible failure, even with C Cincinnati doing such great things. I think, in, yeah, I think overall, Cincinnati, this is going to be viewed as a successful season. But if at the last moment, after all the good that you've done, you squander it and you fall out of the playoffs, that would be, that would be striking and that would be a problem. Uh, one team that's trying very hard to drop out of the playoffs is Minnesota. Oh, my God. Uh, they Balloons. lost. What is going on? 2 0 away to San Jose, just one point from their last six. Uh, not looking good for the Loons. 45 though. points right on that line, and Salt Lake at 44 and Vancouver at 43 right there licking their chops. Vancouver beat Austin 2 0, which was a big win for them to keep them in the mix. So I mentioned that on decision day, it's going to be uh, RSL hosting Portland, Minnesota hosting Vancouver. Uh, Portland and Minnesota only need draws in those games to get in, but all four teams go into decision day knowing with a win they would be in. So that, that's pretty when you, incredible. When you just need a point, it's such a weird type of mentality to take into a game, uh, especially especially if you're playing at home or especially if you think that you are a, a, a better team. And yes, you have to think about you know, bigger picture types of things when you are playing that game. But it's it's hard to regulate and turn on or off or up or down how you uh, how you play. I guess it's part of being a professional, but even for professionals, I think it's difficult. Uh, and we'll end on this. Uh, the Seattle Sounders fell to SKC. That was our game Sunday, FS1. So they are officially eliminated from playoff contention. We were all struggling to kind of put the 2022 Seattle season in perspective, they did achieve something historic, became the first MLS team to win this iteration of the CONCACAF Champions League, and yet it also becomes the first year of their MLS existence where they fail to make the playoffs. We interviewed Schmetzer after game. By the way, great job by him even uh, granting us that yep. interview. And you could tell he was struggling to figure out a way to 
make sense of it all. So I'll, I'll give you a chance to. Well, listen, I, I make fun on a consistent basis of my friends up there in Seattle and, you know, the insufferables up there in Seattle. And they deserve all of it. Having said that, I love that there are the Seattle Sounders types of teams, and in particular, the Seattle Sounders in Major League Soccer. We need more teams like Seattle. Uh, and I'll be honest, we need more coaches like Brian Schmetzer. And I got a lot of respect for the way that he handles the media in particular, because that affects me the most, uh, and the things that he said. And to hear him struggle to come to terms, but be very, very honest and open about how in a year that saw his greatest success as a coach, it also has now seen his greatest failure, given the incredible run that Seattle, and keep in mind that the Seattle Sounders have been around a long time, even before Major League Soccer, and Brian Schmetzer in particular has become the face and synonymous with the Seattle Sounders for many decades now. So he, he feels it, and I think he takes it personally. But you could see in his, in his mind trying to reconcile this, this strange year. I think ultimately it will be looked at, and rightfully so, as a, as a success, given the fact that they did something that nobody has been able to do in the modern era, which is win CONCACAF Champions League from an MLS perspective, but not being able to figure it out. And I know you get, I know it's difficult, CONCACAF Champions League, but even, even Brian Schmetzer talked about how they should have been able to find a way. Given the amount of money that they spend, given the quality of talent that they have, they should have been able over that time period to find a way to at the very least get into uh, the playoffs. Nobody's asking you to win Supporters Shield, but to find a way to be one of those teams that gets into the playoffs. And I think that's what's, that's what's, dis, uh, that's what's disappointing, uh, but it happens. It happens to everyone. It'll be interesting to see if this triggers any types of changes on the field, even off the field. You know, there's always talk about Garth Lagerway up there and, uh, you know, how, how much he is valued. Does he continue on? Even, even Brian Schmetzer, who I think, you know, I mean, not that, he, not that he would be fired by any stretch of the imagination here, but who knows? Maybe he, you know, looks at other places and, and they make more bigger changes behind the scenes when it comes to what's going on uh, next year. So rest in peace when it comes to Seattle. But when you're playing in the, uh, in the Club World Cup, you're probably not going to be thinking about the fact that you didn't make the playoffs. And last thing for me, there is a U.S. World Cup implications here with guys like Jordan Morris yep. and Christian Roldan. As we've talked about, uh, if Greg Berhalter wants to take those guys to the World Cup, they're going to have to get very creative here and finding ways to keep those guys in form. Yeah, I, I think uh, Stu and John were talking about this on the broadcast. Is it is it better to be in this camp that's coming out where you're front and center, or is it better to be with your team playing in Major League Soccer playoffs? I think the interesting thing is the way that Burhalter has, while he says it's about form and everything like that, we've seen time and time again where that's not necessarily the case. So there's almost a part of me that purely from a personal perspective, it – it may benefit a guy like uh, Jordan Morris or Christian Roldan to actually not be in the playoffs and be in that National League team camp and front and center in front of those that coaching staff and justifying what I do think is a real positive uh, relationship and view that they have of him. And I, I still think that both of those guys get on the plane for, for different reasons. Jordan Morris still, and Greg Berhalter has said this, does things that others don't and gives something that he doesn't have, and so he brings something different. And then when it comes to Christian Roldan, I just think from a, a leadership standpoint and a locker room standpoint, I think he's, it's been made very, very clear how valuable he is. That's it. Anything else? All right. Uh, well, there's your MLS roundup. As we mentioned, we will be doing Decision Day this weekend. Uh, we share it with our friends over at ESPN. We will be doing uh, the, uh, the Eastern Conference relative to the game that we are actually uh, doing, which is what, Mossy? Orlando City, Columbus. Orlando City, Columbus. And, you know, we think that those are going to have, there's going to be ramifications uh, from that game, both in terms of making the playoffs and in terms of the position that uh, people uh, finish. We'll be, you know, 
up and around with all the games going on at the same time. And it's going to be fun to see uh, how that turns out. So definitely tune into that because there's all sorts of drama coming down to the uh, final weekend and the final games of this incredible Major League Soccer season. So check that out. All right, we'll take a, a quick break. When we come back, there's all sorts of stuff to talk about when it comes to what uh, happened over there in Europe. And we will get into all of it. Don't go anywhere. All right, welcome back. Uh, all right, Mossy, let's, uh, let's take a look around the rest of the world because there were all sorts of games. I was up early. I don't know if you were up early to see, uh, see a lot of these games. Where do you want to start? Let's start in England, where there were two massive games this weekend. First up, the North London Derby. Arsenal, 3-1 winners over Tottenham at the Emirates. Thomas Partey with a beautiful strike, 1-0. Harry Kane equalized from the penalty spot, 1-1. Then in the second half, Jesus made it 2-1. Then, key moment in the game, Emerson Royale uh, received what many people thought was a harsh straight red card. Uh, Granit Xhaka then made it 3-1. The Gunners take all three points. Very impressive performance, I thought, from them. Yes, and they continue to, you know, I think justify a lot of the excitement and the emotion and the passion and the belief that people have that this is finally it. Um, I will say this. It's going to be really interesting, not just for them, but for all teams, when um, the World Cup comes about. And not just a stoppage, but a major stoppage. And what you're stopping there is momentum, right? And it's almost like a reset when they come back. And yes, they will lose players to the World Cup, but it's even more so that you just stopped this train that is rolling. And it's a very, very good positive train right now. And so I worry if they are able to pick it up, and not just pick it up, but you're picking it up in the, in the holiday season, as all teams are. But it might just throw things out of whack so that when everybody comes back after the World Cup, they, they start anew. And it's almost a – I know the, the points don't go anywhere, but it's almost the start of a, of a new season. So that's, that's the thing that I worry about. But so far, so good when it comes to Arteta and Arsenal. I will say I was very high on Tottenham going into the season. And you could argue with, that with an Antonio Conte team, it's not about style points. It's about getting results. And for the most part, they've done that. They went into this game one point off the top of the table. But I've actually been disappointed in their play – uh, this is the second sort of statement Premier League game they've had this season, away to Chelsea and away to Arsenal. And both, they came out oddly flat and were totally outplayed, I thought. So that's a bit disappointing from them. Uh, from an Arsenal point of view, next weekend, they're home to Liverpool. That's a chance for them to make a real statement and validate this hot start. A Liverpool team that's all over the place. 3-3 draw at home against Brighton. Roberto De Zerbi's debut for Brighton, replacing Graham Potter. Uh, and Liverpool's next two games, by the way, away to Arsenal, home to Manchester City. They, they lose both of those. They might be out of the title race by mid-October. Or, or I mean, I, well, you're always glass half empty. I mean, what if you're <laughs> Liverpool? I mean, isn't this the moment to turn it around and to reestablish yourself? Is this the uh, proverbial uh, banana peel for, uh, or, for Arsenal? Yeah, no. I mean, they already lost away to United. Yep. If they were to lose at home to Liverpool, there would be this narrative that, yeah, good start, but uh, it's, it's somewhat easy the schedule. No it's not, it's not yeah. for real. Okay. Although beating Tottenham does give yeah. it some validity. Uh, speaking of Manchester City, <laughs> that was the uh, big game on Sunday. 6-3 winners over Manchester United in a game that was not as close as the score. It was 6-1 right. in the 80-something minute, and Anthony Martial scored two garbage time goals to make it look semi-respectable. <laughs> but this was an annihilation. Annihilation, Foden and Holland each with hat tricks. Third hat trick of this Premier League campaign for Ellen Holland. He's got 14 goals in the Premier League, 17 in all competitions. What can you say about this young man? Uh, he got me up early in the morning. Okay. I mean, it wasn't the earliest that we've gotten up, but I did set my alarm. It was a weekend. I was able to, had I wanted to, sleep in further. And yet, I mean, in and of itself, Manchester United versus Man City may get me up. But the fact that Erlen Holland is playing and playing so well and that it's just a, a force of nature, this, this beautiful beast that he is, that's why I set my alarm. And look, he didn't you – know, he, he brought it. Uh, and he lived up to the stature, literally the stature that he, that he has. And it's just – it is amazing. I mean, he was it was, a, it was a tour de force from start to finish, not just for him. But for Man City, I mean, the amount and the way in which they retain possession, um, the amount in which they were able to immediately win back the ball, and then just the ruthlessness in the way that they use the ball, and then obviously with Erlen Holland up top, it is, it, it is something to behold. I was telling my dad this, that first half, 
if you didn't know, you would think this was the second leg of a tie in which United had won the first leg 4-0. Right. The way that City were still attacking in waves, even when they were ahead by multiple goals, was incredible. They, yeah, they, and Manchester United could not touch the ball. And even when they did, they, they, there was no going anywhere. Um, the swarming, obviously the, the pressure was just, it was amazing. But, but more so than the pressure, then when they got the ball, it's not just kicking the ball just to kick the ball. It was with purpose. It was incredibly quick and fast. And like I said, ultimately incredibly efficient and effective in the way that they used it. Just a, a, an amazing performance. And what, it, what Alan is doing right now is unprecedented. Okay, three, three hat tricks in however many games it is relative to others that, that have taken hundreds of games to do it. I mean, I, I will say the Madrid media has already started in on. Erlen Holland to Real Madrid rumors. I, I find it really off-putting how obsessed they are with transfer market, signings, Galacticos. They can never focus on the here and now and the team they have, which, by the way, is a team that just won the Champions League that has a player in Karim Benzema that's going to win the Ballon d'Or, that has another player in Vinicius that, to hear them tell it, is a future Ballon d'Or winner. You, they just went through this with Mbappe for two years, and he ended up not coming. And we're going to start this with Erlen Holland now and spend the next two years speculating about him going to Real Madrid. Why are you being such a grouch? That's who they are. And and. Tell me this. Riddle me this, Mr. Mossy, okay? He won't say it publicly, but Erlen Holland, okay? When he thinks about that, does he think, oh, I would never go there. Oh, there's no possible way, okay? No, I, I think he this will end up there. This is a stepping stone to there, okay? <laughs> he, so there's a reason why. He's waiting out Kareem Benzema. He'll spend two or three seasons with City and then go there. I actually think that will happen. One last point before I move on. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo did not play. You could see him sitting there stewing on the bench. I will go to my grave thinking that Ronaldo wanted to go to Manchester City. City turned him down, and so he was forced to go to United. He doesn't make career decisions based on sentimentality. He makes them on where... He thinks he can score goals, break records, win trophies. And, you know, Ronaldo's a confident guy. I bet you he's looking at Erlen Holland and saying, you put me on a team like that and I could be doing the same thing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Messi later on in the show, but is, is this hurting his legacy, especially relative to Messi? In the big picture, no. I mean, he's already... Really? Ronaldo, I, I mean, at this point, it's gravy. I mean, he's already done everything that you a player could dream of doing. I don't but know. But I look, I'm a I, as the kids say I stand for uh Ronaldo, right? In this evergreen back and forth between Messi and Ronaldo. However, it gets a little bit more difficult especially in the moment right now when people ask you that evergreen question and you come up with Ronaldo, especially relative to what Messi is doing with club and country right now. So I yeah, I think I think his legacy is being hurt right now. And, you know, everybody has a twilight of their career, and a lot of times it's not playing, it's not scoring, and you're a shell of your former self. I get that. Very few actually go out on high. But Messi still hasn't had that, and it remains to be seen whether he will ever have that. Who knows? Where, wherever, it, wherever it ends up right now. And I'm not saying that Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo can't have a, a coda and, and go someplace else and kind of rejuvenate everything, and then we're right back where we, uh, where we started. But it's not good. It's not good for him, and it's not good for Manchester United when you're getting your ass kicked and you look around and there's Cristiano Ronaldo and, by the way, Casemiro sitting right next to him. Uh, on the American front in England this weekend, uh, Leeds United nil-nil draw at home against Aston Villa, which is not so bad when you consider that Sinistera was sent off uh, early in the second half, so Leeds played 40-something minutes down a man. Uh, after the game, Jesse Marsh... Oh, uh, I love it. ...very critical of Aston Villa's approach that took some shots at them, said they slowed the game down too much. What did you make of it? So Jesse Marsh, uh, Marsh was suspended, and so he was upstairs, you know, doing the whole thing from the... Uh, you know, the studio or whatever, a, a box or something like that, and watching it from a different uh, vantage point, serving out his one-game suspension. Uh, look, you know, Jesse, <laughs> I, there is two parts of me. One part of me continues to just love the fact that he is not only leaning into the, the beautiful arrogance of uh, being the American and the stranger in the strange land and not taking any and just continuing to say things and needle people and understanding that it that it will needle people and there is a strategy in in it and it takes focus off of others either a bad result or bad performances out there and i i love that about jesse in that he he doesn't he doesn't care ultimately but jesse is a very smart person so nothing is done without being thought through and you know he came out and he talked about how 
you know, our fans are the greatest and this is the greatest environment and our fans don't come here to see this plotting type of negative soccer and they don't come here to see time wasting and all that kind of stuff. It's, there's also the other part of me that says, quit whining, you baby. I mean, you're, you're sounding incredibly sensitive and oversensitive. And in doing so, you're making yourself look, uh, look weaker. And while playing to the fan base is good, there's almost a, a part of me where there's some players and or fans out there that are going, hey, Jesse, that's, you know, knock that off. Because in, even in that game, let alone in other games, you know, Leeds is not this bearer of the beautiful game and the romantic game, despite what Jesse Marsh may, may, may think. They're going to get down and dirty. They're going to get pragmatic uh, uh, out there. And there will be times where they're not playing a very attractive way, but it ultimately uh, gets results. And so Jesse framing it as if he is, th you know, this, this incredibly romantic uh, figure that will die on that hill at all costs, even at the cost of uh, results, that's BS. Uh, Chelsea, 2 1 winners away to Crystal Palace. Christian Pulisic did not start, did not come on until the 80 something minute was the fourth sub that Chelsea brought on. So it looked like it was going to be another frustrating day for U.S. soccer Twitter. But lo and behold, once he gets on, Pulisic assists Connor Gallagher for a wonderful late winner. Graham Potter's had some nice things to say about him. So U.S. fans hoping this might be a new dawn for Pulisic. We're kind of grasping at straws here, aren't we? I mean, <laughs> well, look, not, not, that, not that he didn't have an effect. And look, but we've seen Christian Pulisic in a substitute role. We've seen it go great and seen it not great. But that he came on and that he had an impact on the game, that's kind of what you're designed to do as a substitute, especially given your pedigree. And he came on and he dribbled through a bunch of people and then he you know, kind of laid it off, passed, not who knows, but you know, ultimately it resulted. So we're going we're gonna to take that as American fans. I, I get that, but I, I'm not so sure anything has fundamentally changed. I think having good performances and coming out feeling positive is a good thing. But at this point, I mean, we're just we're grasping for anything to attach to this guy that's in a positive type of light. I'm glad you said that first because I thought the same thing. You know, my, my test on whether a play is really worth highlighting is if it hadn't led to a goal, would we be talking about it? You know, that little layoff to Connor Gallagher, if Gallagher's dispossessed or turns around and pass it backwards, would that play have even registered in anybody's mind? <laughs> it's only because he spins away from a defender and... and curls this beautiful I shot know. into the upper corner. And look, I know we're, we're spinning everything <laughs> towards the World Cup and we need players feeling good about themselves and feeling good about their soccer and their life and everything like that and physically good and mentally good and all that kind of stuff. So look, if this, if this helps bring about a more focused and better and positive Christian Pulisic come November, I'm all for uh, screaming and yelling about it. Uh, you mentioned Messi, so let's do PSG next. 2-1 okay. uh, winners over Nice. Messi opened the scoring with the 60th free kick goal of his career. I don't know if you saw this, but it was remarkable. Yeah. There's an advertising board right behind the goal at the Parc de France that as soon as Messi was going to strike that free kick, they flashed this goat sign, and sure enough, he scores on the free kick. And, Incredible. And Neymar ran over the ball. and it's, it's just I mean, it was just beautiful, and, and there's nothing you can do to stop it, and it's just... It, the guy's just incredible. Playing great. Uh, when he came off late, he got a standing ovation. Nice actually equalized, and then Mbappe, who hadn't started the game, came on in the second half and scored the winner. So 2-1 victory <laughs> Not a for bad substitute. PSG. Uh, I mentioned Real Madrid. Let me do them next. They finally dropped points for the first time this season. 1-1 at home against Osasuna. Benzema missed a penalty late. That would have won it. And that means Real Madrid and Barcelona now level on points on top La Liga because Barcelona beat Stu Holden's Mallorca 1-0. Lewandowski with a beautiful goal. He's got 12 in nine games in all competitions. We talk about Erlen Holland, but he's not that far behind. And, and I think rightfully when people saw this, there was a lot of um, analysis and praise for the way in which Lewandowski scored that goal. Because we, we talk about him so much for his ability in the box. And undoubtedly, one of the greats when it comes to getting on the end of the ball and just feasting upon those in a, in a different way than Erlen Holland, but still ultimately with the same result. And yet, in this moment, he's always had wonderful, soft feet. And I think he's always been um, able to do things uh, from a cre creative standpoint individually but in this one in, in this instance he did it all for himself and that cutback was just 
was wonderful. And it sent everybody watching the game, everybody on the field one way, and he cuts it back, and then he's able to finish in the way that he does with the, with, with the, precision, the precision and the efficiency that, that he has. But I love that it, that it showed a lot of people this look that we've seen before but sometimes isn't as appreciated in this game. Let's head to Germany, where Lewandowski's former club had a pretty good weekend. Remember, Bayern had gone winless in their last four league games, but they put an end to that drought with a 4-0 demolition of Leverkusen on Friday. Just what the doctor ordered. Sané, Musiala, Mane, and Muller with the goals. Musiala con- continuing an incredible start to the season. He's got seven goals and four assists in all competitions. And it was a great weekend for Bayern because Bundesliga leaders Union Berlin lost 2-0 away to Eintracht Frankfurt. P. Fox started but uh, did not score. Uh, much is, to the relief the of Greg Berhalter. Right. Is this the <laughs> end? Not the end of P. Fox, but is this... We know that Union Berlin was punching above their weight to a certain extent. So is this where that train starts to slow down a little bit? Let's we'll see. It could be. <laughs> uh, Dortmund also lost to Cologne. Giorena did not play in that because of the injury he picked up yep. uh, with the U.S. Um Meanwhile, in Italy, uh, the big one there, Roma, uh, 2-1 winner is away to Inter. Uh, Jose Mourinho was suspended for this one, but his team picked up a victory. Chris Smalling with a late goal. You got thoughts on this? Uh, the rumor is Jose Mourinho was in a, a car or a van outside, uh, yeah. outside the stadium. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's what I, uh, I was listening to someone this morning talking about that. Um, this is a big win. This is a big win uh, for what it means. And how about Dybala? I mean, we saw all the fanfare uh, of his of his coming over, but it's one, another thing to actually live up on a consistent basis, and he is doing that. He he scored his fourth Serie A goal of the season. It's interesting with Argentina. I think this run of form is going to get him in the squad, but they've never figured out a way all these years to incorporate him and Messi. They're just too similar. It's, there's kind of a redundancy there. So I think his role is just if the tragedy were to strike and Messi were to get injured or something, they at least have kind of a like-for-like like right. to some degree. But other than that, it's hard for to get him, him and Messi on the field at the same time. Yeah, but I'm talking about specifically for Roma. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, is, he has been worth every penny, and he has absolutely. lived up to... Remember the, I, remember the scenes when he came there and everybody screaming and yelling? And... I'm a huge fan of his. I found the end of his Juve career bizarre, the way they were seemed like they wanted to get rid of him. I mean, you look at that Juve team this season, they couldn't use a guy like Paulo Dybala. Uh, it's bizarre. Uh, but speaking of Juventus, uh, they did get a much-needed win uh, this weekend, 3-0 over Sean Sullivan's Bologna. Sean just <laughs> devastated over this result. Um, uh, we mentioned Pulisic getting a, an assist for Chelsea. Uh, Wesson McKinney with a very impressive assist on this one. The second goal by Vlachovic, he floated a beautiful cross. Uh, so good news there for U.S. fans and good news for Juventus. Well, first off, he started. That's a good thing. We talked about players coming back and the potential for more competition, and I still think regardless, he is looked on, as opposed to a Christian Pulisic, as essential, as a starter. And then you actually do something while you're on the field. He probably, he probably could have scored a goal. And I, look, with all due respect, Sean, it's still Bologna, all right? So y- y- you should win these games. That's it for Europe. I'm going to sneak one yeah, much, much to Sean Sullivan's chagrin. I'm going to sneak one more thing in okay. here. Congratulations to Ecuadorian side Independiente del Valle this past weekend. They won the Copa Sudamericana, which is the South American equivalent of the Europa League. They beat Brazilian giant Sao Paulo in front of dozens of fans in Cordoba, Argentina. You know, these the Libertadores and Sudamericana finals used to be two-legged home and away affairs. And beginning in 2019, Comnebol decided to make them one-off neutral venue games. They wanted to mimic what Europe does with the Champions League and the Europa League and even what the U.S. does with the Super Bowl. They bought into this notion that one game feels right. bigger. Um, it's been relatively successful with the Libertadores. It's been a disaster with the Sudamericana. Nobody's going to these finals. You have a continental final that has the atmosphere of a preseason game. So they might need to rethink, at least with the Sudamericana. But um, I can take my Brazilian blinders off and recognize this was a very good result for South American football. There's a lot of concern about the financial gap between Brazil and everybody else and Brazilian clubs dominating to an unhealthy degree. We're guaranteed to have a Brazilian Libertadores champion because for the third straight year, we have an all-Brazilian final, Flamengo Atlético Paranaense, later this month. This is at least some solace for the rest of South America. Independiente do Valle, great story, tiny club on the outskirts of Quito, no money, but they do Great work at the youth level. Half the Ecuador World Cup squad is going to be players that came from this club. They've also made some shrewd signings. Since 2016, they got to a Libertadores final, and they've won two Sudamericana, 
titles. So very impressive work for them. Deserved winners. It was great to see a small club that punches above its weight beating an underachieving Brazilian behemoth. It reminded me of that Villarreal Manchester United Europa final a couple of years ago. So again, congratulations. Yeah, but to it's them. the exception of the rule, right? I mean, sure. it doesn't necessarily change anything in terms of the haves and the have-nots out there. So, but it's a, it's a good thing to to kind of have happen. So congratulations uh, to them. All right, let's take another break, Mossy, and when we come back, uh, let's do some Ask Alexi. Huh? Uh, does that sound good? Yep. All right, don't go anywhere. Okay, welcome back, and it's time for uh, Ask Alexi, that uh, point in the show where you send in some questions, and you can do it in a bunch of different ways, including all the social media platforms out there. Keep in mind that our handles out there are S-O-T-U with Alexi. And, I mean, we got the, we got the hotline cranking, Mossy. Uh, 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. That is our State of the Union podcast hotline, and we got all sorts of stuff. And we picked a couple... Uh, a uh, couple of folks who uh, left us messages uh, this week. Uh, where do you want to start, Mossy? Uh, well, yeah, we've got a couple of voicemails, as you mentioned. Let's go to the first one right okay. now. Okay. Hey, guys. It's Lee from Nashville. Obviously, Nashville FC fan. Uh, also, Newcastle before it was a bandwagon team. Uh, so I've earned my lumps with them. Also, a David Mossy fan here. Anyway. Uh, my question is about Greg Ber Berhalter after this last window. I mean, I've been one of the Berhalter out people from the beginning. I don't really like how he oversimplifies or overcomplicates things. I think we need to play to our strengths and try and simplify the game plan a little bit. And he's kind of done this the entire time. So I'm not surprised that we are where we are after this last window for the World Cup. So that being said, let's assume, I think, I think we, we're going to show up in the group and we're going to get out, and it might be like a typical U.S. 1-1-1 one, one, and one, get out on points uh, World Cup group stage. And then let's say we play the ne Netherlands in the second round, and it's another, you know, Belgium, Tim Howard got close but really didn't deserve to win the game, uh, and we lose, you know, in a respectable fashion. Where does that put Greg? I mean, is he the coach? in 2026 you know like i'd really like to see some fresh ideas cutting into that crucial crucial point in u.s soccer history that 2026 is going to be so you know like what what i guess my question is what gets greg like the job for sure and what gets him fired after this world cup thanks all right, Lee from Nashville. Thank you, first off, uh, for the message. And yeah, I think I understand what he's, uh, what he's asking here. We've talked a little bit about this over the, over the years, let's be, uh, let's be honest. Um, so we know what the, uh, the group is when it comes to the U.S. Obviously, first game against Wales, second game against England, and third game against Iran. Uh, I don't care if Greg Berhalter and company win the World Cup or bomb out without a point and finish last. I don't think that a national team coach should have multiple cycles, okay? So that's, that, that's, that's always been my, uh, my take. So regardless of what happens in this World Cup, I think you move on to somebody else, and maybe in particular with this team. And Lee, you, you, you hit it on the head in terms of how important 2026, and it is an incredible carrot that probably Greg Berhalter or anybody else would love to have. Having said that, it's not that, he's, that, he, that he couldn't be good going forward, it's just that I think it gets stale, uh, and it can get stale very, very quickly. And keep in mind, we've talked so much about how young this group is. And Greg Berhalter, for that young group, I think has been very, very good. I disagree with you, uh, but I think that Greg Berhalter has been very, very good for that group. But as the dynamic changes, and as these young men grow into older men, the way you have to coach them, the way you have to deal with them changes. And I think that that's hard if you have already through a cycle dealt with them in a certain way to change as a coach. So that's, that's you know, the, the, the first thing. What happens for him to continue? I do think that there is a sentiment at Soccer House, it's no longer Soccer House, but at the United States Soccer Federation and the leadership when it comes to Brian McBride and Ernie Stewart, not that no matter what he is, he is our guy going forward, but I think that they would like to kind of continue this process that they have started with Greg Berhalter. And that happens in terms, I think, of first off, getting out of the group. I think if he gets out of the group, which, which it has to be said is not necessarily something that you, you, uh, well, you celebrate it, but it's been done before. If he gets out of the group, 
I think that U.S. soccer will continue with him. For me, if he were to continue, at the very least, I would obviously get out of the group and then put in a, a result that you said a respectable result. I think you have to win that round of 16 game against anybody except for the Netherlands. I look at the Netherlands as now my, much more so than the Denmark, as my dark horse. I think that this Netherlands team is really, really good, and I think they have a pathway. I think that they will win their group. Keep in mind that the Netherlands is in a group with, as we've mentioned before, Qatar, Ecuador, um, let's see, uh, uh uh, the Netherlands, Netherlands, uh, Qatar, Ecuador. Qatar, Ecuador, Senegal, Senegal, Senegal. Oh, I can't believe I've got Senegal. So they should win this group. But if the U.S. faces Senegal, Qatar, or Ecuador, I expect the U.S. to find a way. It's an easy, no, but find a way to win that game. And if they don't, it will be a disappointment. If they bomb out against the Netherlands, and as Ian or as uh, Lee says here, it's a respectable type of performance, then I'm okay with that. I will. I will leave with this. The performance against Belgium was only respectable in the fact that Tim Howard stood on his head, okay? <laughs> so that would not be the type of performance that I look at as respectable. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, what constitutes a successful World Cup for the U.S.? I think we all agree quarterfinals, unequivocal success, group stage failure. The round of 16 is that weird in between where, as you mentioned, the how, I think, could play into it. If the U.S. were to get outplayed by England and lose, get results against Wales and Iran, qualify second in the group, then get played off the field by the Netherlands and lose, that's a weird one. You know, it's kind of some people will argue success, other people know it's it's going to be right in that in between. Uh, yeah, a, a little bit reminiscent of 2014, which uh, in the moment it felt like a huge success, and then it was only afterwards that I feel like people thought about it and said, "Wait, was it? We only won one out of four games, and if it wasn't for Tim Howard, would have gotten blown out by Belgium." Now, to be fair to Klinsmann, that was a tougher group than this one. They were in a group with Ghana, Portugal, yep. and Germany, yep. and then had to face Belgium in the round of 16. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting figuring out exactly what would constitute a success or failure for the U.S. Good question, though. Uh, and look, we could very easily have a one-one and one type of form. There's nothing. There's no shame in that. You get out of the group any way that you possibly can. Okay. Yes, ideally we beat Wales, we beat Iran, we have six points, and everything's uh, everything's fine. But a one-one and one in performance is certainly a possibility. And if that gets us out of the group, fine. And I do want to commend Lee on being a fan of mine. Yes, is that what he said? I'm a big fan of, yeah. of Mossy. Well, I am too. So if, if, if he's a fan of Newcastle, he probably shares my love for Bruno Guimarães, a Brazilian midfielder on Newcastle. Oh my. So he he can tweet me about that at some point. Oh please. my goodness. Um, we got another we go one, right? Our, yeah, let's go to our next voicemail. Okay. Hey guys, this is Connor from um, Illinois. I have an interesting question for you, so bear with me. Um, I argue a lot with you know football players, unfortunately, about the level of soccer in America. I was just wondering, what do you think it'll sort of take to change that perception of the average, you know, American sports fan about soccer in, you know, the U.S.? Because I think we are in, like, the best spot we've probably ever been in. You know, will it take more of a stronger MLS or, you know, change the style and play or, you know, something like a the top you know, World Cup finish. Uh, thanks, guys. All right, Connor, good question. Um, I will concur. It was a good question. I know you kind of stated that at the beginning and <laughs> it remained to be seen whether it was going to be a good question, but I think it, I think it was. Um, okay, so a couple of things. And I actually want to spin this into something that happened this week with, uh, with Kellen Acosta. But first, just in, just in general, as I've said many times before, we, um, we in America... And, and all of America, not just soccer, uh, not just the soccer community, we love to kick ourselves for what we aren't and what we haven't done. And every once in a while, we also have to pat ourselves on the back and realize and have some perspective of how far we have come. But part of that kicking is ingrained in our culture where we want the best, we want to see the best, we want to be the best, and we expect the best regardless of the realities or the circumstance. And that's kind of what makes us great. Uh, is that that it's fostered in that that competition and that demand and the high expectations uh, that w uh, that we have? All of that is to say we've come a long way. It doesn't mean that you're not going to talk to your American football friends or others out there, and they're they're not going to have that perception and they're not going to poo-poo what America is. But it is still pushing that proverbial boulder boulder up the hill, right? 
and it's it's gotten easier, but it's still it's it's still not easy. The you know the the perception of what American soccer is has cha- has changed dramatically. So what ultimately can get it over that hump? Well, first off, as I mentioned, winning. So being on a in a consistent way, winning the way that the United States women's national team does, that changes perception immediately, not just of the team, but ultimately of the sport. Competing with the rest of the world, and let's be honest, a sport that they have a massive head start in, and that when it comes to the compare and contrast that happens, doesn't occur with any of our other sports, and in particular, any of our other leagues out there. So you mentioned Major League Soccer, and whether it's Major League Soccer uh, or USL or any league out there, that inevitable compare and contrast is going to ha- is going to happen. And for for many years, and and certainly now, we end up looking uh, lesser than others, and that's 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 understandable. Even if it's not the reality, that is the uh, that is the perception. But that that can change with time, and and then. Ultimately, what it comes down to, and this is where I'll get into the Kellen Acosta thing, it's also on us. It's also on us to champion the sport. And, you know, I've talked before about how we eat our own. And, you know, the, the cannibalism, if you will, from within the soccer community is mind-numbing and this civil war that we have amongst ourselves about what soccer is and what it isn't. And again, I'm not asking for blind faith. I'm not asking for Pollyanna type of stuff out there. Uh, but I am asking for, for us to be able to look at ourselves and to take pride and to celebrate how far we have come and how much potential we still have and not simply poo-poo it because it is domestic or because it's not what you see around the world. And the reason why I've mentioned Kellen Acosta is this week he did an interview with uh, Soccer America, friends over at Soccer America. And he was asked asked about the way that MLS players are treated and the way that MLS, Major League Soccer, is looked at. And I want to read you the quote because it's really, it's really interesting. And it goes back, like I said, to that evergreen American soccer civil war and cannibalism that colors so much of not just the discussion of the national team, which it does, but also just in terms of soccer and American soccer. He says, Kellen Costa says, I don't want to open up a a whole can of worms, and I'm not trying to stir the pot by any means, but people have a negative outlook on MLS. They automatically think that if you're from MLS, you're not good enough, and that if you're in Europe, you have to be in the team. He's talking about the national team. That's not necessarily the case by any means. People fail to understand that. Nowadays, it's just trendy to say that. I get it, but they use the results of the team and MLS players as scapegoats. If the game isn't going well, it's because of someone from MLS. But if so-and-so was there, it wouldn't happen. It's a coulda, woulda, shoulda. Kind of frustrating. But that's football, and you have to deal with it. Instead of preying on the downfall of players on the team, if you really uplift, promote, and help them, I'm sure we would have a stronger team. It's crazy. People want to see certain guys fail so bad just to prove their point. But it's like, don't you want the team to do well? Now, that last line about people wanting to see certain guys fail, that is absolutely uh, what happens. And it's human nature. I, I get it. We've all done it in different ways in life ourselves. Is, is this a cry that's going to change anything? No. Should it change anything? No, because I think Kellen Costa also recognizes that this is what it is. Would he like it to be different? Yeah, but it's not. And I don't want in any way what I'm talking about here to be construed that, that U.S. national team players, whether they're domestic or, or playing overseas, don't deserve criticism and shouldn't be criticized. And that you have to just shut up and be positive. No, that's, that's, not the, that's not the case at all. But what he is saying here absolutely exists, all right? Doesn't make it right or necessarily even wrong. It's just the reality of what is, uh, what is going on. And that is the challenge right there. It's encapsulated right there. That is the challenge, is to change that perception. It is to change how people feel about you when it comes to being relevant, when it comes to being credible, and if and when you can get to a point where people don't look at you any different from where you are playing, now we're cooking. Now we're cooking. I think that that's a long way off, but, I'm, but I think that it's doable. And I do believe that it can be done. And what gives me hope, Mussy, is I talk to this, this younger generation. And with each passing generation, 
it dissipates a little bit. And we are, I think we are less cannibalistic. I think we are less insecure. Um, doesn't mean it's not there, and, it's, and it certainly hasn't gone away completely, but it is less and less. So who knows, in the future, and it doesn't mean the other side doesn't have to work, whether it's Major League Soccer or any league out there, work for that credibility. You're not just be gonna give it, you're not just going to be given it. You have to work for it, and you have to earn it, and it's not just some sort of uh, gift out there. So anyway, good question there from uh, Connor. Ma Ma Amasi, anything to say on that? No, no, you covered it. No? Me. Really? Well, I just think it's interesting, Acosta... Uh, is a player who's made no secret of his desire to go to Europe mm -hmm. and has felt like he was sort of held hostage in MLS. That doesn't may mean that what he's saying is wrong, but it, he was just an interesting messenger for that point. You know? Yeah, but I think he I think he sees it. And look, I, I know that there is an element of social media that this generation, it's baked into what they do. I, my generation didn't have that constant buzz uh, as opposed to Kellen Acosta. And a lot of it, you know, I, I know it's not a... Uh, it, it's it, it's it's not a focus group and it shouldn't be a focus group but we spend so much time on what happens on social media and you know there's a lot of criticism and there's a lot of crit criticism of players but again it goes i'll finish it with this and it goes to what what he said uh, where wanting to see people fail just to prove your point that that is a constant. That happens in all walks of life, and it's not going to change just because Kellen Acosta pointed it out or anything. But to deny it means that you're covering your eyes up because it absolutely exists. And it, it sucks, but it's the reality. Uh, okay, Moss, you anything? That's it. All right, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, it's the end of our show, and I'll give you my one for the road. Okay, we're back. Uh, Mossy, it is the end of our show. At the end of each and every show, I give you my uh, one for the road. Mossy, as you know, uh, we are coming to the end of an era uh, with the broadcast rights for Major League Soccer going over to Apple starting in 2023. And, you know, who knows? I think that there will be, you know, hopefully uh, a... Um, an element when it comes to Fox and ESPN out there where we have involvement with Major League Soccer. But right now we know the majority, uh, not the majority, all of it, is going to be found over there on Apple. And with that comes a lot of changes. And since 1996, when the league started, you know, the way that the league has been broadcast has been much more traditional and you have had, you know, your regional broadcasters out there. And so this is the end of a lot of those faces, and more importantly, a lot of those voices that have come to define these Major League Soccer teams, and in many cases have stretched multiple generations and have become the faces and the voices for those Major League Soccer teams that have become part of the fabric of those communities and of those cities out there. And these are men and women that work in front of the camera and behind the camera on a week in, week out, month in, month out, and in many cases, year in and year out basis to bring you the productions of, uh, of Major League Soccer. And there is a big unknown as to what is going to happen when it comes to Apple. I I'm sure that there will be those that continue on and are part of the Apple production going forward. But unfortunately, I think that there's going to be uh, some and maybe many that aren't part of that going forward. And one of the things that Major League Soccer I've found over the years has... Uh, has has brought value to is providing opportunities that don't necessarily exist in other sports and in other leagues for men and women looking to break into the industry. Look, a lot of people want to work in the NFL. Okay, that's fine and well, but there are limited opportunities, whether it's on camera, whether it's in front offices and all that kind of stuff. And Major League Soccer has continued to give people an entree into the sports world and the sports business world out there or the sports communication world, broadcasting world out there that otherwise <clears throat> wouldn't exist. And that's a, that's a wonderful value to bring. And so my worry is that that goes away. And again, I don't know what Apple is ultimately going to do. But regardless, I think that this is a wonderful point to stop and to say thank you, to say thank you to all of those men and women who for now multiple decades have not just done the job, but in most cases, done the job with very few resources. And, you know, you, you figure it out. And all of these people have found a way to figure it out. And in doing so, they have become as important as the teams that they are covering and the players that, that come and go. But these voices out there 
have become synonymous with the incredible moments that they have called, these incredible teams, these incredible players, but also just this connection that you have that we talk about in so many other sports. And maybe there'll be new connections that will be established going forward when it comes uh, to Apple. But regardless, these connections are coming to an end. And in that, in that final moment here, in this last week of, uh, of the regular season, I just want to shout out and say thank you to everyone that has done so much hard work and people that have been around even from back when I was starting in the league and playing until now. And it is, I know from speaking to them and seeing them work, a labor of love. They have this league in their heart and they have poured their heart and soul into broadcasting this league. And that it has come to this, uh, you know, this end and this, uh, this conclusion. Uh, I don't know what the future holds, but if you're looking back on these last few decades, uh, thank you. Thank you and well done because you have been as important to the progress of not just Major League Soccer, but to soccer in the United States as any of the folks that have uh, been out there kicking the ball. So a hearty thank you and, and, a, and a good luck and a hopeful type of uh, ending here that uh, we see your faces and we hear your voices going forward. Anything, Mossy? No, that's it. A reminder, we have a second podcast this week. We'll, yep. we'll cover the UEFA Champions League and also really spin it forward towards Decision Day in MLS. Can't wait. And then obviously, yeah, like you said, Decision Day on the, uh, on the weekend. So we will hear uh, and see you. Well, you'll hear us and see us later on in the week. All right, anything else? That's it. All right, uh, we'll see you later on in the week. And until then, and as always, this is the State of the Union. I'm Alexi. That's Mossy. And size the day.